Challenges in healthcare delivery have compounded with clinical staff being exposed to the Omicron COVID variant. Reduced staffing has brought on its challenges to most already strained state healthcare systems and the people working in them. However, over the past two years of the pandemic, technology has played an increasing role on the front end for patients and consumers at home and clinicians in the medical setting. Much more is planned in technology that will deliver efficiency, reduce risk and make available new models of care. This has the potential to touch the working lives of all stakeholders and recipients of care. Australian Health Journal spoke to leaders in healthcare delivery, developing or using technology to further transform healthcare. I'm Amanda Catamol, the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Digital Health Agency. At the highest level, the role of the agency is to create a healthier future for Australians through connected healthcare. The gateway is a really critical piece of, of enabling technology, and the idea of it, of it is it provides a secure and scalable platform for um, exchanging and accessing health information right across the health ecosystem. By integrating the gateway with all different clinical software across the health system, um, it means that GPs, hospitals, specialists and others will all be able to talk to each other more easily and exchange the kind of information that's critical for the best care for Australians. And that enables them to get, you know, both better connected, um, up-to-date information, more responsive and more holistic because that's really where we're going here. You know, the future of health is, um, is really a you know an even more wrapped around holistic digitally enabled healthcare system and this is a critical component of though the ability for all those parts of the system to engage with each other more seamlessly much more rapidly and then to have that link in to a patient at the point at which it's most needed for them. This is really the beginning of a journey, but once we get there, you know, Australia's healthcare system is is where is gonna be as, as it really is already the envy of the world, but it is gonna be where it should be, right at the top. Um, we have got such extraordinary foundations in place already. You know, we already have a personally controlled electronic record. That's a, that's a huge foundation stone. We've got, um, you know, fully interoperable parts of the system, things like e-prescribing, medications management and so on. And, and, of course, we have remarkable healthcare in this country, you know, delivered by practitioners right across the system. This is uh, designed to keep us there, to make sure we are always looking to the future, building out for what's next and providing practitioners with all of the tools that they should have at their fingertips going forward and consumers to ensure that as they look to that extra information, that they become more and more engaged uh, in their healthcare and in their healthcare conversation and that they've got that in their hand right when they need it, where they need it, to enable them to be full, uh, you know, full participants in their, not only their healthcare, but their well-being. Uh, and, and we are seeing a system you know, really lifting towards a conversation about well-being, about personalised patient health, about drawing on the best research we know and having that available right when we need it. My name is Jason King. I'm a primary care physician. I work in Yarrabah, which is in far north Queensland. I'm originally from Western Australia. My family are Ewood Noongar people from the southwest. We come from a little place called Dandarragan, which is about two hours drive north of Perth. Um, here in Yarrabah, uh, the population here in Yarrabah is predominantly Aboriginal people with uh, some Torres Strait Islander and South Sea Islander people, as well as non-Aboriginal, non-Torres Strait Islander pa patients here as well. And we service a community of about 3,500 people. The community here access health information from a variety of different sources uh, here in Yarraba. Um, obviously, as a as the community controlled health organisation, um, we we service those three and a half thousand people who see us on average about seven times a year, which I think is about twice the average uh, for an Australian uh, citizen to see their GP. Um, and apart from direct services, we have a lot of outreach services in the community. So we have a, a, a cohort of Aboriginal uh, health workers who work directly with patients out in the community as well as 
supporting them to come into the service and also over to Cairns for visits and further afield for telehealth, for example. Um, but uh, also through social media. So we, we release uh, increasingly a lot more information via social media to help um, reach out to our community so that they can have access to the latest information. If you understand that Aboriginal communities have a deep and a um, very uh, rich understanding of how to transmit information orally, then you can take advantage of that when you're trying to reach out to communities. Um, you know, social media is an interesting beast. I think it actually taps into, if done correctly and done respectfully and safely, it taps into that transmission via oral language. So you will see lately um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, young people are, are really tapping into things like TikTok and Instagram um, and, and things like that, which, which helps to them to express their, their lives and their um, experiences in a really vibrant way. A place like Yarrabah is uniquely placed to take uh, advantage of digital health tools. Uh, given we are a remote community, we're also very close to Cairns and, um, and therefore the rest of the world. Uh, and I think, you know, as infrastructure for uh, technology and information systems it, uh, expands and improves, uh, the individuals who all carry around, you know, mobile phones and other you know, portable devices can have a really connected uh, access to their health. Things like um, the, the My Health record, uh, one step in that direction. Uh, I think other, you know, community-based apps and uh, the development of these apps based upon what the community needs are is essential. Uh, I spoke about this in 2014 at the, 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 um, the HESA conference about the need for you know, companies to engage with communities genuinely look at what their needs are and what their desires are for their future as an expression of self-determination for their own health. Uh, we see communities across Australia who are really desperate and keen to, to connect to the world around them, to stay connected to their own people as they have to move around. Um, a lot of people have to move away for the health reasons such as dialysis in remote locations or to hospitals for you know, advanced treatments and surgeries. So information technology is another way for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities to stay connected. And I think there's a really passionate um, desire for those tools to be put into the hands of communities. My name is Stephen Flynn and I'm the General Manager for Baxter Healthcare Australia and New Zealand. In terms of dialysis, there's really two forms. There's hemodialysis, which is typically conducted in the clinic. A patient would typically go into the clinic three times a week for about four, four hours and dialyze in the clinic. And then there's peritoneal dialysis. And this this is typically done in the patient's home. Uh, and on automated peritoneal dialysis, this can be done nocturnally while the patient sleeps. Clearly, the benefit there is that a patient on automated peritoneal dialysis can live a full and active life. There are also options in the home with hemodialysis called home hemodialysis. And again, that provides a patient's with a lot more options to live a full and meaningful life, be able to go to work and not have such a, a burden of time committed to their therapy. Remote patient management is an important part of the hospital in the home revolution. Our hospital systems are under increasing pressure from an aging and growing population. Delivering hospital care in the home is more affordable. It can reduce the resource burden on hospitals and it can offer patients a more convenient and an equivalent outcome. Remote patient management gives clinicians confidence to treat their patients at home. The innovative technologies help to reduce the frequency of hospital visits for patients and provides clinicians with more frequent access to their patients' therapy. The COVID-19 pandemic and the pressure it has placed on our hospital system has only accelerated the move towards home-based therapies. Telehealth and remote patient management services have helped patients and clinicians to stay connected during the pandemic. 
Baxter Healthcare launched our first two-way remote patient management system for home peritoneal dialysis. ShareSource remotely connects the patient's home PD device to the clinician's database in their clinic. Data from the patient transfer is available for the clinician to securely and remotely view on their hospital dashboard. Because it's two-way, the clinician can also act on this information. ShareSource allows the clinician to remotely adjust a patient's home therapy securely from the hospital's dashboard. We have nearly more than 1,600 dialysis patients across Australia and New Zealand are now currently benefiting from ShareSource. What one of the patients said to me is it's like their guardian angel. This is a home-based therapy that they conduct mainly at night. And so at night, while they're doing that therapy, the next morning, all of their data is uploaded to the clinic. And that gives patients a great deal of confidence that they're being looked after, even if they're in very remote parts of, of Australia. We estimate for every 100 patients on ShareSource, there is a potential saving of $300,000 a year compared to traditional automated peritoneal dialysis. For patients with chronic kidney disease, we've seen an increasing trend towards home-based dialysis during this pandemic. Remote patient management continues to be an important part for helping to keep dialysis patients safe at home. My name is Gronjo Lachlan and I'm the CEO at Caritani. My name is Shalane Vlahost, I'm the Director of Education and Business Development at Caritani. Caritani provides early intervention and prevention services for parenting support for families with children aged zero to five years. Caritani's vision is for parents to raise happy, confident and resilient children. And to do that, we are about maximising our access to care right across the service system. Caritani is an organisation that's approaching 100 years of age in uh, 2023. So we have been evolving over those 100 years for from place-based um, services where families access services in clinics, in residential units and parenting centres over the last five years, particularly to increase our access and with increasing technology, Keratani has been delivering virtual care suite of services. And now families are coming from all over New South Wales, including rural and regional spaces uh, to access our services through virtual care clinics. Caritani has been able to adapt most of our clinical services into a virtual platform. So we have a virtual residential unit where families can access 24-hour support uh, rather than coming into a residential unit where they have to pack up their whole family. Um, they can come in and get that care and support from a child and family health nurse, uh, social worker, psychologist, GP, paediatricians, and do that from the comfort of their own home, which actually uh, really strengthens a, a parent's confidence Children are doing much better when they're at home in their own environments. Um, but we also have virtual breastfeeding clinics. We have virtual home visits, which is more of that short-term kind of day-stay model. Uh, we have parenting webinars. We're able to provide parenting workshops um, and those uh, evidence-based parenting programs as well. And we can do all of that virtually, as well as our perinatal infant mental health support, where parents can connect with a psychologist um, and really engage when they're trying to address those uh, perinatal uh, mood disorders. So really all of our services have an adaptation for virtual care. Rural and remote uh, geographical areas are now able to access these services that are typically really based around some of the larger metropolitan areas um, of New South Wales. And so it really eliminates that barrier for those families that have found that very difficult. And I think, you know, even now when we think about um, COVID and how we have restricted access, and that's happening really nationwide, is that we have can still provide that care and support for families in this virtual setting, where many services might be winding back or don't have that the ability to provide that virtual access. So we can be really adaptive and responsive so parents can continue to receive the support because they're isolated from their families as well. So we have a whole community response in terms of being able to um, provide that care. 
It also provides a, an aspect in terms of um, workforce capabilities. So we always have a work, you know, we're addressing workforce sh shortages all the time. And so that clinical expertise, expertise sometimes can be in a place that is difficult to access for families or have to travel long distances. And once again, we're eliminating that barrier, but we can also work with some of the local clinicians and services and grow that workforce capability by using those virtual services. Accessibility is a big thing that we've touched on. There are certain communities, rural, regional, culturally diverse communities and Aboriginal and remote communities where that can, you know, have a few more challenges. But as we build trust and this becomes a modern blended way of working, we can see that the influence uh, nationally is becoming a much more strategic response. It's not just a, a knee-jerk, we have to do this because we're in COVID-19. It is becoming a blended model of care that is highly acceptable as a care delivery, not just in the healthcare system, but also in the social sector, uh, social services and the disability sector. So we can see a normal national growth and Karatani has been at the forefront of some of that leadership development um, that we are sharing now broadly with organisations right around Australia. My name is Zara Lord. I'm the CEO and founder of UPaged. UPaged is a technology platform that connects on-demand clinicians with work in healthcare organisations in a more safe and meaningful way that doesn't break the health budget. I'm an eighth year registered nurse specialised in intensive care, and I've worked on both sides of on-demand nursing with recruitment agencies. This experience has given me a really unique perspective. I found that the on-demand placement of clinicians lacks clinical decision-making. It has a virtually unknown nurse arriving on shift, so poor allocations and a lack of support means that this nurse struggles to perform to a high standard. But I also found it's expensive, and the high costs being charged to healthcare organisations is causing hospitals and healthcare organisations to limit their use of on-demand nurses to meet budgets, which leaves clinicians working short-staffed. The main users of the UPage platform are nurses. We have over 2,500 profiled on the platform, and we're soon diversifying to supply the whole of health workforce. So that's kitchen staff to doctors, um, you name it, they'll be profiled on the UPage and connected to healthcare organisations in a meaningful way. On the facility side, it's booking managers, HR managers, talent acquisition managers, or department managers looking to fill vacancies. We've seen some immense growth over the last 18 months. We've filled over 4,000 shifts, and that equates to more than 50,000 hours of nursing hours worked. In COVID-19 times, UPage's value proposition is more poignant than ever, and that is through enabling safer workforce mobility that doesn't break the budget, and then inform clinical decision-making to get the right nurse in the right shift for the right price. Uh, UPage has saved one hospital in just 12 months, $85,000. Now that's an entire nurse salary for another year and a full-time equivalent uh, workforce they could have had in their, in their team. However, that's only the beginnings of the benefit that that hospital experienced in a 12-month period because they were able to tap into on-demand nurses that they knew what they were, um, they knew what they were getting. They were able to um, allocate these nurses really appropriate patients which means that the patients get more specialised care and the nurses are more satisfied. Um, this led to three of our nurses transitioning across to permanent in that organisation. This is exactly why we started UPage, to create a marketplace to get the right nurse in the right shift for the right price. Mm -hmm.